Sometimes it's very important not to miss out on a stage in a process, isn't it? Some stages in some processes are vital and some stages in processes require us to stop and think, something I'm not always brilliant at doing. I'll give you an example of a process where I didn't do this very well. Uh, a few weeks back I changed a tyre on my bike. I went through uh, the stage of getting all the stuff I needed to change the tyre and I went through the stage of actually getting the bike upside down and actually doing the job, although it took me all morning. Uh, the stage I missed out was selecting a suitable place to change the tyre. Um, given that there's dirt and oil all over a bike and it can get everywhere. So uh, I chose, I didn't really give it any thought, and so the rather expensive, colourful rug in our front room, possibly the one thing, one place I shouldn't have done it on, was my chosen spot. Uh, mercifully, it was just dirt and not oil that got on it and it wiped off, but I missed out a process, missed out a stage in a process that was fairly important there. Sarah was not very happy. Um, Equally, I, I, I cast my mind back many, many years ago when I did A-level economics. Uh, we had time to revise at home. You get study leave, of course. Uh, I went through the stage of actually going to school and going to the lessons. I went through the stage of actually turning up to the exam and doing the exam. The, bit of, the stage I missed out was the stage that involved actually doing any revision at home. Unfortunately, my sister was off at the same time on study leave for her GCSEs and we ended up watching Kung Fu films quite a lot of the time when I should have been revising for economics. So that was the stage I missed out, and I didn't get a very good mark as a result of that. So some slightly silly stages, um, some slightly silly examples there, but you get the impression. Stages and processes are important and they cannot be skipped. But also in our very, very fast paced world, um, well, we live in a very fast paced world, don't we? We do these days. And because of that, we, we can miss out on processes every day that maybe like 30 or 40 years ago were just second nature to us. Remember when you used to have to write letters? You write letter, you needed to get pen and paper. You then needed to actually think about what you were gonna write because you didn't wanna make a mess of the letter and have to waste paper and start all over again. Uh, and then once you'd written it, you had the chance to reread it before you actually shoved it in an envelope, put a stamp on it and posted it. Nowadays, what can you do? You can, in about eight to 10 seconds, type something on Twitter, type something in a text message, or type something on Facebook, and just press post, and it's out there instantly. And because of that fast-paced environment, those stages of being a bit more thoughtful and careful in your preparation just go out the window. And that's one of the temptations of the modern world, I think. And as a result, it's, I think, far easier to end up typing something which either offends someone or upsets someone without really meaning to. Stages in a process are important and we, and we skip them out at our peril. Why am I talking about that? Well, what we see uh, from John the Baptist on this third Advent Sunday in our Luke 3 passage is that there is in, betwe in between the stage where God promises a Messiah in the Old Testament and the actual stage where the Messiah turns up and begins his ministry as the Messiah, in between those two stages, God inserted a very important one which should not be missed. And that stage was the call to repentance. Very, very clear in this passage, isn't it? And in fact... Have you ever thought about this? In that process, repentance is so important to God that he doesn't just uh, say it, well he does, but he actually sends someone specifically slightly before the Messiah, months, maybe a few years before the Messiah, to emphasise it in preparation for the Messiah's coming. That is, of course, John the Baptist. So I'm going to think, as we think about John, as we think about stages and processes and those sorts of things, I'm going to think about three things. Firstly, true repentance is vital. Secondly, true repentance is concrete. Thirdly, true repentance leads to the life of the Spirit. Firstly, true repentance is vital. This whole thing about missing out stages and that being a bad idea... Well, I think that's what we see 
in the first few verses here, verses 7 to 9, with the whole crowds coming out to John to be baptised, and with his kind of quite stern words that he gives to them, John tells the people that they are missing out the whole repentance thing, the whole true repentance thing, and that they can't do that. Now to us, let's be honest, let's be honest, John calling the crowd to approach him a brood of vipers might sound harsh, and it might not be the way that we would speak, but John was describing the reality of what the nation of Israel at that time had become. A bit more on that later. See, they come to him and he tells them, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Meaning, meaning, if you're really serious about repenting and returning to God and being baptised as a symbol of that, then there need to be changes in your life which go with it to show you are for real. That's what John says to the crowds. Nor... Can the people of Israel just say, well, I'm descended from Abraham. Remember the big A? Back in the Old Testament, God promised him. God promised to bless him and his descendants, and I'm one of them. I'll be fine. I've got, ah, you see, I've got the right family tree, so I am safe. John calls that out as well. The crowd don't explicitly say it here, but it seems to be in the background. God can't be limited like that, John says. And John points out that with his comment about stones can become children of God if God wills it. God doesn't need them. They haven't got God in a bind with his promise to Abraham. And there's a warning here for us too, just in passing, not to put our confidence in the wrong things. Because that's absolutely possible. And that's absolutely possible even for people who've been church members for a long time. Perhaps it's especially possible for people who've been church members for a long time. Because how real our relationship is with God is what counts, not the outward, uh, the outward acts. How real the relationship is and how that's lived out in our life. John's warning is loud and clear. Why is it so loud and clear? Well, partly because the punishment that is hanging over the people of Israel is serious. There's a lot of threats of judgment in this passage. We need to accept that straight up. Now you see, to give a bit of context on this, the very last verse in the Old Testament, don't look it up, look it up later if you want, but the very last verse in the Old Testament, in Malachi chapter 4, there you will see that Malachi describes John the Baptist's future ministry as a ministry of bringing people to repentance. The reason being, so that the people of Israel might avoid God striking the land with a curse. Things had got that bad. So God sends John so that that doesn't happen. God sends John so that judgment will not fall on Israel, or at least will will not fall on Israel to those who receive him, to the Israelites who receive him before. And the judgment will not fall on them before they have a chance to respond to the Messiah. So John emphasizes to the people of Israel that the threat of God's judgment is looming large. The whole thing about the axe being the, at the root of the tree. We read that expression. What does it mean exactly? Well, I think it means... You know that kind of process you have where you want to line up a swing, right? You know, uh, so that you can make sure you've kind of aimed it right and you can hit, so that you hit what you want to hit. It's the same when you like, I don't play golf or anything, but I think it's the same when golfers line up a swing. The golfers, they kind of put it against the ball and then they kind of line it up. I think that's what's in view here. It's at that point where the, the blow is being lined up. So judgment, John warns, is imminent. So people need to repent. If the people of Israel are the trees, then the axe is being lined up. The key thing that will decide whether the axe actually strikes is how each tree responds firstly to John and then secondly to the Messiah. Will they repent? 
and will they believe? That will decide it. And repentance, you see, see, it's obvious here, it's vital. And although we aren't members of Israel 2,000 years ago, we need to be aware of that too. We need to be aware of that when we evangelize as well. We can't miss it out. I've said this before, and I like the illustration. In order to turn to Jesus, we have to turn away from our sin. It's like a 180 degree spin from sin to Jesus. Repent and believe. Repentance is vital. Secondly, true repentance is concrete. True repentance is concrete. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, and you can see this in the passage, it's not, repentance is not just a very vague, kind of vague, general, not real thing. But something, actually, which starts in the heart and mind, but actually works itself out in the details of our lives. It's concrete. You see that clearly in the teaching of John. The way in those middle verses, in verses 10 to 14, you can see it in what he says to the different groups in those middle verses. First of all, John warns the people to start living their lives in a way which shows they are genuine about repentance. But then the question comes back. What shall we do? And firstly, he gives an answer to everyone, a general answer. Share your goods. If you've got two tunics, give one to someone who hasn't got one. Simple. I'm not sure what the modern equivalent of a tunic would be because it was like a kind of a warm, long garment we all wear. But maybe a coat, I'm not sure. But the point is, you get the point. If you've got to, give to one who hasn't got. And interestingly, I know a Christian who, just a couple of days ago, was bought some gloves, but already had a pair. So less than, less than an hour later, when they were kind of had these two gloves, pairs of gloves on them, they found themselves talking to a big issue seller in the city centre who instantly complained about having cold hands. And they just instantly handed over their second pair of gloves. Just worked out very closely. Received two pairs of gloves, find someone who needs one pair of gloves, give one pair of gloves. Very close application of what John says here. But then, but then having had that general instruction, a couple of groups start to ask for more details. First of all, tax collectors. Tax collectors. What does John say to them? Don't collect more taxes than you're supposed to, i.e. stop ripping people off. Then the soldiers chime in. What about us? Notice in passing, sermon for another day, he doesn't tell them to quit their jobs as soldiers. But... This is what he says. No more getting people up against the wall and shaking them down for cash. Or making up stuff to get them in trouble or to blackmail them. You know, a certain amount of power comes with being a soldier and carrying a sword all day. Well, that stuff that you've done, kind of roughing people up for a bit of extra pocket money, stop it. Stick with your wages. This is very concrete guidance from John about what exactly repentance looks like. It's not just try to be nice. It's not, it's not that vague. It connects directly with their situations and the jobs they do. Repentance should look the same for us. Repentance should work itself out in the details of our lives. And as our lives change and metamorphosize and as we come into new roles, etc., 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 we might find that repentance needs to work itself out in new ways, in new concrete ways in our lives. It should affect the detail of our jobs, our relationships, our commitments, all of it. And we need to pray to the Lord. We have to ask the Lord to show us what these areas should be and how we should, how we should approach them. But notice as well, there's a thread running through the three sets of instructions John gives. In each of them, he's condemning greed and heartlessness. You notice that? Perhaps this is that was a sort of a sin which had become so hardwired into the people of Israel at that time that they barely noticed it as an issue. John needed to point it out to them. 
Going back to those last verses in Malachi, it's interesting that part of John's ministry described there is described as a turning the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the children back to their fathers. So it seems that things in Israel have got so bad that even the kind of basic love and responsibilities of of the family unit have broken down on a national scale. Greed and heart, heart, heart and heartlessness. Are there ways for us that we can fall foul of being greedy and heartless without even realising it? Are there things we do that we barely even register as wrong? And in this passage, John points these things out to the people, but are we open to people highlighting things to us? Are we humble enough to accept the counsel of others about things which maybe need to change? We all know our culture is very, very individualistic. Very. We're encouraged to be ourselves, make our own decisions, carve our own way in the world, etc., etc. And I think an unwillingness to be challenged by others, even when it comes from a place of love and constructiveness, is part and parcel of that. So we need to be gracious and open to brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's not always easy. It's really not always easy. But God, I think, can use it. Our culture would think of other people giving you advice or challenging you as a bit of a slap in the face. But our Lord can use it to change us for our blessing and for the blessing of others around him and for his glory. So let's be open to it. When it comes to specifically greed, definitely a temptation for us as Christians who live in the West, I think, and it's definitely a challenge for me. Definitely. How we view having enough can be very skewed. That becomes clear when you visit other parts of the world where people have less. When people or situations show us our blind spots, let's be humble enough to repent and do things differently. Thirdly, true repentance leads to the new life of the Spirit. True repentance leads to the new life of the Spirit. And we receive it through turning to Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the one greater than John that he spoke of. You know, in a sermon about repentance, which is really not a very popular word, full stop, in any context ever, it would be very easy to just kind of, for people to go home, for us to go home today, to feel just all beat up and guilty and nothing more. But that's not what God wants for us. Remember what John's role was. Remember, his role was in leading people to repentance and it was a stage in the process of preparing people for the Messiah. It wasn't that they were supposed to stay groveling in the dirt forever and nothing more with no hope of anything else. The message was humble yourself so that you can be lifted up by the Messiah. Repent in order to be restored. And what a restoration John describes here. The last few verses he tells us, verses 15 and 17 to 17. No, he's not the Messiah. The Messiah is coming, and when he but and when he comes, he will baptize not with H2O, physical water, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Jesus and his ministry was so, so, so much more amazing. And through him, people would come to access the living water of the Holy Spirit, to be reborn, to be transformed, to receive eternal life, i.e. to become new covenant Christians, the only kind of Christian there is. And that eternal life begins in this life. If the ministry of John the Baptist could only really humble people, Yes, it could get them to turn their ways around. But it can only really humble people to lead them to the ministry of Jesus. Well, the ministry of Jesus could lift people to heaven. Jesus can lift people to heaven. He can exalt them big time. He can exalt us big time. But only if people accept Jesus for themselves. Because notice here, just as we start to close, there is still a warning here. The threat of imminent judgment is still here. 
Remember, the axe was about to swing at the trees. Well, notice here uh, how the Messiah has got his winnowing fork in his hand, i.e. he's picked it up and he's ready to use it. The crops have been harvested in this little analogy John uses, and he's about to separate the goodness of the wheat for making bread or whatever from the rubbish of the chaff, i.e. all the leftover bits that are no good for anything. They just get burned. What John tells us here is that how people respond to the Messiah, whether 2,000 years ago or today, decides whether they receive the fire of the presence of God, the fire of the presence of the Holy Spirit, like the tongues of fire at Pentecost, or they receive the punishing fire of God's judgment. And perhaps that feels like hard teaching. But read the rest of the Gospels. Jesus says much the same thing in various places as well. There is an abundance of spiritual riches available for those who repent and believe in Messiah Jesus. But there is also spiritual death for those who do not come to him or even who do come to him but without that necessary stage of repentance hoping to have him as their mascot on the mantelpiece but refusing to follow him and obey him and be transformed by him john led the people in repentance so that they could have the abundant life of the messiah And in kind of a microcosm, just the words repent and believe kind of sum that up. Don't they? Notice in the last verse, it's interesting, isn't it? It says, with many other words, John spoke the good news. You might look at this passage and go, it sounds rather like bad news, with a few bits of good news overall. But remember remember that big picture. John came to bring the people back so that the Messiah could exalt them. I don't know how you feel today. I don't know how you feel. You feel either complacent or you feel beat up or you do feel the joy and presence of the Lord today. But we have to heed these words of John but also see the promise of the one who baptizes with the Spirit. We're going to take a moment now just to wait upon the Lord and to invite him to come and meet us.